now move on to the panel discussion titled COVID-19, Accelerating the Inclination Towards a Cashless Society. And it's my pleasure to first welcome and introduce the members of this panel. Nagaraj Mailandla, Founder and Managing Director, FSS. Ravina Rai, Chief Operating Officer, NPCI. Rama Vedashri, CEO, Data Security Council of India, a NASCOM initiative. Sajid Sivanandan, Managing Director and Business Head, Google Pay and Next Billion User Initiatives, Google India. Shalini Warrior, Executive Director, Federal Bank. Shankar Subramanian, Managing Director and India Head, Global Transaction Services, Bank of America. Siddharth Dumta, Country Head, Global Liquidity and Cash Management, HSBC India. This session will be moderated by Kunal Bandi, partner KPMG in India. Over to you, Kunal. Good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry for that uh, technical glitch. Uh, and I, I uh, hope all of you are there with me. Uh, good morning to all the panelists and uh, the ladies and gentlemen who are in the conference today. I'm very happy and excited to be here among this uh, eminent panelists who have loads of experience in the payment space in the country and have in fact uh, worked on a number of initiatives uh, uh, which have led to the tremendous growth which is happening in the digital payments in India. While we say that the digital payments are growing, uh, India you know, is still a cash society when it comes to retail payments and the milestone to reach the cashless society, which is what uh, we are talking here, is, is still uh, somewhere ahead. Uh, there are lots of initiatives from regulators, governments, private investments, etc., which are there. The uh, question which I had, and I thought, uh, you know, I will start uh, by asking uh, uh, Praveena you, uh, in your view, you know, what can be some of the motivations for people to go cashless and use digital channels only? And at the same uh, time, I also want to have your views on the same question from a merchant's perspective. So both from a consumer as well as merchant, what would be some of those uh, motivations which you believe, uh, you know, are important? Uh, before you start off, you know, given we have limited time, I would request you to be brief so that we can, you know, uh, go through uh, the question and then take everybody's uh, over to you, Praveen. Thank you, Kunal, and uh, good day to everybody. Great to be part of this panel. Um, and uh, you've really taken the best question for the first, it looks like. Uh, so what really drives uh, movement from cash to digital payments? You know, I think primarily it is habit change. So it is the it is a driving of what is a habit. You know, today we are very comfortable. Everyone walks out with their wallet or a purse. And in that, we know, we keep some change. We keep some notes. You know, uh, some of us might carry a card or so. Uh, and that is a habit that has developed over generations. You know, our fathers did it and our grandfathers did it. And maybe many generations back, there were different kinds of uh, currencies and so on. So changing habit is what really we are talking about here, uh, which derives from many factors. Uh, overall, of course, you have the policy framework, the legal framework, the regulatory framework, and all of that exists. So let's not go there. Coming back to the consumer, it is about the convenience of the consumer feels um, and how easy and comfortable it is for the consumer to uh, use a digital payment instead of uh, a cash transaction. Uh, and this has to be combined with ubiquitousness, i.e. if I, let's say I take, you know, mobile payments as an example, you know, I'm just able to carry my mobile phone out and nothing else. You know, I actually move away from the wallet and just using my mobile phone, I'm able to complete my day's requirements. Uh, so the ubiquitousness of the acceptance of uh, payments is going to be very important for the for this big change habit change of digital payments and the third is trust when i say trust you know when you when you hand over cash to somebody uh, there's very little chance you know i think gone are the days when somebody would look at a little uh, big tear in the note or you know something like that and refuse to take the note from you uh, but otherwise you know that you know your coins and cash always work they will always be accepted uh, which means that our digital payment system should have extremely high availability extremely high reliability you know and have all the uh, key facets that are required to build that trust for a, for a consumer. Now let's go to the merchant side and uh, these are two sides of the same coin. One doesn't work without the other. 
uh, the for the merchant, you know, from everything that we've seen and uh, the the sort of research that we've done, it's always about the consumer. The merchant is running a business. The consumer is a customer. So whatever the consumer really wants to pay, the the means and method that the customer wants to use, uh, the merchant is usually happy to supply if there is a a certain threshold of volume available yeah, not for that ad hoc one off uh, you know payment or one off customer who walks in but if out of 15 people who walk in uh, into a shop in a day you know 12 of them want to make a payment of a particular sort the merchant will ensure that payment mechanism is going to be accepted after that so the consumer is is again the driving factor over there and it needs to be at a reasonable cost so i think the merchant is a businessman you know runs a you know runs a business and hence uh, reasonableness of the of the cost and something that's very affordable and doesn't really bother his expense line too much also becomes an important factor. So I think these would be the the driving factors. If we get these basics right, then this uh, train will keep chugging along very well, and we will also pick up momentum. I should add, you know, this is, we are in the COVID era, uh, the unlock era. Uh, you know, this uh, this conversation is in that space. So safety is going to be another angle that I will add to this. Uh, you know, we are seeing that it is coming, uh, coming to the fore. Uh, you know, people do want to avoid, uh, you know, uh, handling of of cash, uh, and there is a certain segment of both merchants and consumers who would be very comfortable feeling safer. Uh, you know, like the mask and like washing your hands. I think WMD, you know, uh, wash mask distance seems to be the new acronym, and uh, you know, maybe you know, digital another D for digital payments is what we need to add to that as another layer of safety. Uh, Thanks, Pravina, for that uh, uh, you know answer and and covering the both the sides uh, very beautifully, uh, right from the convenience to the trust and adding the COVID dimension of uh, safety, uh, which we are in fact seeing on from a contactless uh, payment uh, you know related uh, uh, requirements and needs uh, coming up, uh, and also from a merchant side that it is end of the business. How can they make a business model right? Uh, uh, taking the same question forward to Mr. Nagaraj, you, you know, you have been in this industry for a very, very long time and you've seen this industry growing, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, you're also providing services to a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, participants in this business. Uh, what would be your take on the same question in terms of uh, motivation for customers as well as, uh, you know, for the merchants? Mr. Nagaraj, I think you're on mute. Uh, good day to you. Um, we've been here for 30 years in this business on the payment side. We don't do anything else. So I have a rich experience of putting the first ATM in this country to issue the first card in the country to all the way to digital payments today. We cut across almost everything today in the company. And we also work very closely with Pravina and other people in NPCI, RBI and other people to make uh, the, the shift from cash to digital happen. But however, the reality is that cash is here to stay, right? And uh, while the share of cash uh, in the usage is coming down, volume of cash has gone up, okay? In the COVID situation, we were affected, we run about 40,000 ATMs in the country, right? Our, our cash came down to about 40% during this uh, COVID period in the first month. It's already bounced back in May to 70%, and we are almost to normal today uh, in June. So it doesn't show that because of COVID or because of digital being here, cash has not gone away. The number of ATMs have gone down, but the number of transactions have gone up. You know, uh, So finally, after several years, our business has become viable on the ATM side. We went through ups and downs on it, especially the what we felt in Demon, where our digital volume went up, we had an effect on the ATM. This time in COVID, we have seen equal volume on all our channels. Whether it's ATM, uh, point of sale, internet, mobile, digital, we have seen a, 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 a fair share of increase in all the uh, channels on the volume side. So it's very difficult to say uh, which is going to be the, you know, the best way to do it and as far as cons consumer is concerned he is looking at uh, acceptance right a frictionless way of making payments safety security 
and fulfillment finally wants to ensure that the end of the day end of the transaction the money has transferred to uh, either himself if he's withdrawing a cash or paying to somebody else it has safely gone and there's no hassles of chargebacks dispute or you know settlement process so as long as all these things are concerned the customer will go towards whichever he feels is convenient for him it's a convenient based methodology so all the channels are going to stay uh, and each one will grow based on how the market moves that is what on the on the consumer side merchant side similar but only difference is today the merchant is faced with so many uh, so many opportunities to accept various means of uh, payments payment channels so so the merchant has to be geared to handle this and has the time to handle this so the speed at which the transaction can be completed will be uh, very key for the merchant side as well as his uh, after completing the transaction again fulfillment of money transferring to his bank account or to his still in the in the, in the shop in a small shop is what is going to be uh, the factor for him the pricing is dictated by you know the government of india rbi npci and other people as long as uh, it is made viable for the for the players as well this whole acceptance of digital will be a successful journey in that we also need to make money out of this thanks uh, nagraj for that uh, uh, you know insight uh, uh, around how the cash is still growing uh, you know while at an overall level digital payments have grown one of the point which you you did to is you know the different uh, uh, opportunities and methods which are there in the market uh, so which, which brings me to the next question around you know a lot of uh, global companies uh, large banks uh, are there india itself is uh, you know doing a lot of stuff when it comes to digital so while you know there are a lot of uh, uh, success stories out there in the world we have our own few uh, what i was really keen to look at and i thought uh, sajid uh, you might be uh, the best person to share your thoughts uh, here uh, you know given your, your background what payment instrument do you think you know is the best suited for indian uh, scenario and what in your view is required to make customers stick digital payments and after the introductory offers dry up so that's that is something that we are seeing uh, do lead to upsurge uh, but you know what as mr nagra was saying uh, cash is still out there and one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, you know uh, drive is to see how we reduce cash and bring in more and more digital payments uh, so, so Sajid, what uh, to you for your thoughts uh, and insights? Oh, thank you, thank you, Kunal, and uh, thank you for having me uh, on the panel as well. You know, look, when it comes to payments, India is writing the playbook. Uh, you know, for the rest of the world to follow. So that, in of itself, is very. I think it's very inspirational. Uh, GPay, uh, Google Pay, which was launched as Thais, first in India was conceptualized and then you know developed for India. Uh, and the reality is, look, what we offer here, uh, Google Pay, is very different from what we offer in the rest of the world. And so one of the things we are doing is that we are taking those learnings from India, you know, and, and to the rest of the world. So, so it's wonderful to see that. And I think, I think uh, you know, India will continue to show the world, um, show the way to the world, right? So uh, that's, the, that's the good part in this. I think your, your other part was what payment instruments are best suited. Uh, and, and look, you know, I think instead of thinking of it from an instrument, it's it's very critical for us to think of the attributes or, you know, how do you really uh, think of what people want from payments or from handling their cash? Nothing is more important uh, to people than the money that, you know, uh, belongs to them. And so simplicity, reliability, and trust are the three most important factors for people to you know, embrace digital payments. Um, so any instrument that has these three things, I mean, these three are like base, uh, table stakes, if you will, right? For, for uh, any person to uh, adopt digital payments of any, of any kind. So that's the way that you know, I'd encourage uh, the industry and anyone who's sort of thinking about getting into this space to, to, to think of it. Uh, you know, if you look at sort of uh, our data, 
uh, the reality is majority of our users are actually from smaller cities come from beyond the top seven cities in India uh, for us so if you if you believe that that is the case um, then for those users right they, 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 they may or may not necessarily be digital natives etc and all that but what they understand is look if it's simple to use if it's reliable and if it's trustworthy I'll use it and and so having those qualities are very very essential uh, I think the last part that you uh, last question you had was uh, you know what happens or what is required to make a customer stick uh, look the way I think of that is uh, and you know I'm very much a student of this industry uh, as opposed to this panel that spent many many years uh, on this but at least what I've learned in in the time that I've been in this and and sort of uh, uh, watching the industry grow is that the arc of of uh, a payment sort of service if you will follows three three stages number one people generally have to be comfortable that they can send money to other people they know right like so so p2p the number two is you know then the arc as it progresses they need to be comfortable paying some bills you know and and we've seen more and more of that uh, happen and and you know up is a good example of that and uh, number number three is when they actually start paying merchants you know you like go out to shops or you'll order and everything so any any payment service that sort of traverses this arc and does this uh, in a simple, reliable, and trustworthy manner of P2P, P2C, commercial, as in paying bills, and then P2M, uh, you know, will 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 do well uh, and, and sort of uh, ensure stickiness. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Sajid. That's very, very interesting, you know, focusing on core attributes. And, and your, your insights that uh, the, the product uh, uh, GPA is uh, doing fairly successfully in, in, in the hinterland of the that, that's very interesting to know. But that also brings me to the next question, uh, uh, you know, that uh, with the COVID and earlier with the monetization, of course, uh, you know, the digital payments really, uh, really, you know, uh, took off. Uh, but, uh, and there are there a are lot of initiatives and incentives also which government is, is uh, pushing in. While uh, you, you, uh, you know, you mentioned that uh, the, the hinterland is also seeing uptake. What I wanted to also understand is that uh, when we look at uh, paying and accepting, you know, digital chain, uh, payments, and, and looking at the infrastructure and the customer needs uh, in in the tier two, tier three cities, uh, what would be the you know uh, uh, some of the uh, channels or the products uh, which would be more likely to be successful in tier two and tier three uh, cities. So, uh, uh, Shani, I would like to invite you here, uh, and and uh, you know, uh, you are uh, uh, you a bank which is having a wide uh, uh, you know spectrum of customers uh, across the uh, country. Uh, so, wanted to take your uh, thoughts uh, on how do you see this uh, you know the, this element of. Uh, Increasing the uptake in tier two tier three cities uh, can be you know more addressed and, and enhanced. Over to you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kunal, and uh, pleasure to be on this panel. So good morning, everybody. Um, I think um, from my perspective, whether it's tier one, tier two, tier three, um, I honestly think it's going to be UPI that will rule the roost. And it's really about what Sarvashiv is the attributes of um, simplicity, reliability, and trust that he mentioned. I somehow think uh, UPI kind of meets those requirements from an attribute perspective. It's um, kind of intuitive for customers. They have the ability to try out various apps before they decide which one they're comfortable with and they use it. It is ubiquitous to what Karina said and getting increasingly so, um, you know, any bank account can be used, less expensive. So I think it meets, a, it ticks a lot of those boxes that are required from an attribute perspective and therefore, you know, primarily driven by um, some of the efforts that the government is doing, NPCA is doing, as well as meeting these attributes, I think UPI will be. And that, that's true whether it's tier one, tier two, tier three, and we are increasingly seeing that in our network. But if you switch from the consumer side to the merchant side, uh, probably a slightly different view from that standpoint. And I think that's where a large part of the battle is really going to be on how to get the merchant side of things aligned from a digital perspective. Um, our personal view in Federal Bank um, and me and my team working on it, we think uh, QR codes are the way to go. Um, there's a lot to do with QR codes that is uh, contactless, simple, 
um, you know, particularly in this COVID days when contactless has become so prominent, anything that is contactless, we think, will help, um, you know, increase the tempo. Uh, having said that, I think um, there's some things that you need to, you know, get the merchant to overcome. Um, otherwise, if he doesn't see volumes in it, he's not likely to kind of margin of effort that is required from a QR perspective. Um, and some of the experiments we are doing, we are having a very interesting conversation going on, for example, with a uh, Kotori of uh, kind of auto rickshaw drivers in some of the tier two tier two cities that we're present. In. Uh, what do we do to help them overcome this um, thing to move away from cash into more digital modes? And our discussions with them have clearly been around how easy or simple it is to go to QR codes. All they need to, they don't need a machine. They can you know just put it in their auto rickshaws and therefore you know make it convenient for customers to pay. So that's an interesting conversation we're happening, and uh, we have and. Uh, We've made some progress with that group of customers. Yes, there is a learning for them. There is a learning for the consumer, no doubt. There is a learning for the acceptor of the payment. And, you know, reliability, um, you know, just make sure the cash actually goes is one of their concerns because there's the immediacy of cash is difficult to overcome. Uh, another interesting conversation on this front is, I think all of us are aware of the fact that neighborhood Kirana stores have suddenly become much popular in the COVID era and they have traditionally been cash acceptors. Is there a way we can start migrating them into some of these uh, more digital channels? And here again, the benefit is from a QR code perspective, there is no pause machine required. Some of those kind of physical investments that are required are not there. So I think the merchant side of things will have a slightly different view. My merchant side of things will move more in our sense to you know QR codes. We obviously have to do a lot of work around, you know, safety, security, reliability, um, and, you know, some of the stuff that I'm sure this panel will explore and view, of course, which is resilient of the network, et cetera. But uh, the journey is started, and I think these two examples that I've given of conversations that have been happening will show you the extent to which this is becoming popular in the so-called tier two, tier three cities. Thanks, uh, thanks, Shari, for that uh, interesting insight and, and you know, clearly bringing out that merchants is, is really key to uh, drive the next wave uh, because merchants are equally, you know, core part of the uh, of the ecosystem. Uh, I would like to, you know, uh, move uh, Siddharth to you, uh, you know, from uh, being part of a global bank uh, who is seeing, you know, payments across the world. Uh, and any you know, insights, experiences which you would like to share with respect to the same question in terms of how the you know the digital payments can be further enhanced and the, and the uh, use can be further increased. So uh, thank you, Kunal, and again uh, delighted to be here on this uh, panel. Uh, uh, to your question, in terms of uh, the the experiences from a global perspective, in fact, I, I will pick up what Sajid said. Uh, in fact, when I look at the digital payment space, India is clearly, uh, you know, writing the playbook uh, for the rest of the world. Uh, in fact, our entire digital payments infrastructure, okay, which is built around the so-called India stack, you know, which is the open standards and the APIs on which UPI and Aadhaar is driving, is really a blueprint which a lot of countries and the central banks are actually studying, okay, and and looking at replicating, uh, you know, in, in their markets. So I think uh, when it comes to digital payments, India is definitely uh, you know leading uh, the world. However, there are a couple of areas uh, where I think uh, we can learn and and we can uh, uh, you know uh, do more than what we are doing today. A couple of areas which I would like to call out. Uh, one is in terms of the whole open banking and the in you know the sharing of information you know with consent. Uh, I've been hearing, obviously, everybody talking about the acceptance at the consumer end, and uh, you know the uh, and you know the merchants, you know, from a digital payments perspective, and what can really drive uh, this. Now, I think we we need to we need to look beyond the payment uh, as a standalone or uh, digital payment as a standalone point in time activity, but look at digital payments as something which creates data points. You know something which kind of for both the you uh, you know the individual and the merchants you know with digital payments over a period of time it creates a repository of data okay and with proper framework in place and with with consent which can be put in place through open banking and the account aggregator initiative 
you know, which are being driven by a few fintechs and, and the banks, it can create an ecosystem of that information sharing, which can then be leveraged, you know, for various other financial services. So, for example, an individual can have a better credit rating assessment or can get credit easier if they have been a, a far greater user of digital payments. And the same is on the merchant side. So, uh, you know, if, if the merchants uh, are accepting digital payments, which means it's creating a repository of data, which is not possible in case of cash. And that can be then used in terms of kind of uh, creating uh, a flow of credit, you know, to merchants, you know, which is very important from a growth perspective. The other piece which I want to call out where I think we can uh, uh, do a lot more is in terms of usage of, uh, you know, technologies like blockchain and the, uh, the distributed ledger. Uh, so today we kind of just talking digital payments, which is, you know, one leg of an entire interaction which may be happening. So, uh, you know, there, there are multiple examples. So if, if you look at the land records, okay, it's all completely paper. The point I'm trying to make is that a lot of governments are investing into these new technologies to completely digitize, you know, the entire interaction which may be happening in a particular ecosystem where the, the payment or the digital payment is just that last leg of the value exchange. So I think these are some of the areas where uh, we, we can do a, a lot more, uh, which is open banking and the use of blockchain and DLT. Uh, uh, thanks for sharing that insight. And again, you know, reiterating that India is really writing the playbook. But one question which comes to my mind, and Shankar, I would come to you, is in terms of use of technology, you know, the newer things, DIT, Yosuda spoke about, AI, ML, data science, etc. Are there any learnings which you can share uh, from across the world, you know, which, which uh, India can really uh, adopt uh, and, and, you know, further uptake the adoption of the digital payments? Uh, uh, Shankar, over to you. Sure, Kunal. And uh, thank you again. It's a pleasure to be on the panel. Uh, you're right. I, I think data analytics is, as as a science has been, uh, you know, uh, being used globally for for many many years, and it's not only restricted to fintech. It's used across healthcare, manufacturing, agriculture, and the likes. And I guess uh, a very recent example that we saw of data analytics coming into play for a strategy was was uh, I guess some of the listeners to this uh, uh, presentation would have seen the latest SEC filing from Starbucks where they kind of called out a, a pivot in their strategy of moving away from setting up uh, shops in the US to uh, a go-to uh, or, a, or a takeaway kind of strategy. And that's, that's purely from data analysis that they did. Uh, obviously, one would assume that the COVID situation would have probably hastened their decision making. But to be honest, if you go through the, the filing, they have referenced the fact that they looked at the data of their key customers or their regular customers. And 80% of them were typically the guys who used to come and do a takeaway of the coffee. So they completely have changed their strategy based on analyzing the data uh, of their customer behavior. And they've taken a decision to pivot their strategy from setting up shops to setting up, uh, you know, uh, centers uh, where, where you can just pick up your coffee. Uh, expand that into, into banks, credit card companies. Uh, they've again been somebody who's been regularly using data for, for, for analyzing credit card trends are, 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 have been a, a, a repository for, for banks or credit card companies to decide uh, you know, which sector should they focus on? Where should they give their reward points? How should they, which which uh, brand should they tie up with for, for additional reward points and stuff? And just, you know, extrapolate that to a situation what we are facing today. Uh, ability of banks to know where the consumer is spending or where consumer spending is coming back, the, the, you know, as the pandemic evolves itself, uh, is, is such a useful data point for banks to credit decisions on a particular industry or a particular sector. They use that as a very base reference and our bank at least is referencing it on a weekly basis. We are analyzing the credit flow and consumer spend flow to identify uh, you know sectors that are that are returning back uh, as, as the pandemic evolves. Uh, closer home to India, again, you know, data analytics uh, has, has again been a very, very uh, you know common theme. Uh, it has again been used across industries. I think sometime in 2013, uh, revenue from this whole data analytics, big data mining, as the case may be, was predicted to be about $2 billion, uh, with a growth of around 23% on an annual basis. So obviously, it's a space that's been, uh, that, that, that has been worked on, and industries and companies who are aware of uh, power distribution companies using, using data analytics to identify system breakdowns. Uh, you know, or analyze or predict system breakdowns, which has obviously improved the customer uh, customer satisfaction and, and, and customer loyalty with it. 
and obviously, you know, uh, fintechs. We all talk about it. I think our our understanding of data analytics, at least in a broader sense, has come in after the fintechs have started, especially the ones on the credit side of it. You know, the ones who are giving out your 90 second loans and stuff like that, who obviously are using uh, data in a big, big way to take a, uh, to take those decisions, right? And uh, obviously, again, GST. Another very very useful piece of data for these fintech companies to decide, uh, you know, their their credit making decisions. And Sadar just alluded to it uh, in terms of creating that digital footprint uh, by using, uh, you know, uh, digital means to make payments well, and receive yeah. payments. You're obviously creating a digital footprint which which gives you that chance. I guess, uh, you know, uh, yeah. to sort of conclude, my another point is that this is being used very very actively in India as well as globally. And there are enough and more examples of banks, of, of industries, banks, and customers benefiting uh, by this data analysis uh, that, that are being done on a regular basis. Thanks. Thanks, Shankar. And I think I took three points. One is, you know, being very customer focused, like a takeaway, uh, you know, story which you shared about uh, predicting the breakpoints or the challenges in the system through data. And also, you know, offering uh, very, very specific products. So, you know, uh, thanks for sharing that and, and, you know, some of the stories about how it was uh, useful in bringing uh, more revenues for the participants and driving growth. Uh, in digital payments, you know, I don't think so. Our, our discussion can be over unless uh, we also look at an important element of security. And, and we do keep hearing about uh, security incidents uh, coming in. Uh, uh, and and that uh, you know has a bearing on customers uh, trust as, as we, we spoke about earlier uh, uh, rama i would like to come to you and, and no better person than you who is uh, you know at the center of it also influencing uh, uh, in not many things what the government is doing uh, what is your take uh, on security concerns around arising out of you know these incidents and its impact on digital payment services and any insights which you'd like to share with the audiences uh, what do you rama Thank you, Kunal, and good morning to everyone who has joined us for this webinar. Uh, yeah, before I get into the security and the privacy issues, uh, we we should acknowledge that I mean uh, some of my uh, fellow panelists talked about we setting the playbook for the world. I think we've really come a long way, particularly in retail and consumer payment uh, payments, uh, enabling truly twenty four by seven frictionless payment. But we still have some way to go when it comes to uh, enabling interoperability between the various instruments and various players in the ecosystem through interoperability and making it frictionless and i think we also still have some way to go on solving what is this holy grail of light touch regulation for low value payments i think we have some way to go in terms of low value payments truly making it frictionless and for the provider and for the consumer what is that light touch regulation so now when we look at uh, security and privacy most of that you know broadly in the digital payments transaction chain uh, it comes in the area of authentication and authorization right almost everything is around that authentication and authorization because whether it's a security concern or privacy concern when you evaluate the whole supply chain it broadly falls into these two buckets i think we have an opportunity as an entire industry plus the regulators whether it's rbi or npci or even the government looking at how can we look at and really envision a future modeling for authentication and uh, authorization which truly leverages the technology i think we still have highly centralized there is a concentration risk and because of that it could also be security risks in case there's a big big ticket cyber attack on any of the platforms so how can we truly decentralize it and reduce that concentration risk of the payment platforms but when it comes and similarly i think when you look at security there are two ends one is how do you step up the consumer awareness and when you say consumer we are not just talking about rural citizens we are also talking of sometimes very highly educated urban citizens falling to a phishing attack or the uh, you know uh, sharing their otps so there is a stepping up the user awareness on the other side the platform and the providers i think we are now moving towards how do you build cognitive abilities in the security how can we make authentication which is more privacy aware and privacy sensitive right so there is a certain responsibility in the platform and the providers in ensuring that we make sure that the platform is architected 
for a privacy aware or a privacy first and a security first principles by design so that we are totally minimizing the lack of awareness on the user side at the same time i think there is needs to be a higher awareness and responsibility from the user when they are looking at we i mean we truly uh, citizen needs to be living in a cave if they don't really understand the basic principles because the entire ecosystem of institutions like rbi have been doing so much mass media campaigns we ourselves have been doing so despite all of that it doesn't seem to be changing the safety practices and the user behavior when they resort to digital payments so that they stay away from these phishing attacks so i would say that there is a need for building those privacy principles or privacy design and security design principles from the platform side provider side as you not going to be aware user is going to take all these risks is not going to look at all the awareness campaigns we done and how do we make security uh, more cognitive understanding the risks maybe in terms of authentication can we re envision how do we do authentication and authorization based on the user behavior i think we need to look at how do we leverage those technologies whether we look at how do we use more of rpa and the dlt technologies we have, while we have adequately or more than harness the power of ai and ml and nlp in the way that digital transactions and platforms and solutions are being built are we doing enough in terms of leveraging both rpa and dlt i think we have some way to go particularly when it comes to authentication and authorization from the device side are we using or uh, harnessing the power of biometrics and identity and governance of that identity on the platforms i think we have some more way to go but i think primarily uh, the i think uh, madam prabina talked about it in terms of user behavior we still have the highest cash to gdpr ratio right in there how do we make sure that the we earn the trust of the citizens and we retain that trust because i think in digital platforms while there is a momentum for digital platforms we are also seeing a wave where there is a dip at some point of time i think the trust and making sure that there is a safe uh, way to transact and where and interoperability between payments because a user is having a debit card maybe many of them also now have a credit card but they also use wallets they use upi upi to bank bank to wallet there is a lot to be done so i'm saying there is a certain responsibility on the provider side and on the users thanks thanks roman i think uh, you know some of the points which you mentioned around bringing security by design uh, you know bringing in cognitive uh, uh, you know technology based authentication authorization are, are really some things which uh, can help and of course it's a responsibility of everyone uh, to build the trust uh, i think i'm also you know uh, actually uh, past the time which i have for the uh, panel uh, we got a few minutes attention from the uh, you know host to to have so i i'll just have one question and and uh, i think question uh, it's to you uh, uh, shalini how fast uh, in your view will rural india embrace digital payments both uh, from a customer and uh, merchant side so being at the the role which you have uh, if you could maybe share uh, your thoughts on how fast uh, you know the, the rural india will will uh, adopt digital payments uh, thanks kunal i think if you turn to rural india i think mentioned something to that effect that a large part of the users that are there on google play actually come from some of the so called rural area so how fast will it go Uh, i think there are two sets of actions that we will focus on one is uh, and taking what i said which is the whole customer security piece of it how do we uh, give the customer the confidence that these channels are safe and reliable um today um you know platform providers the regulators are all investing extremely heavily on the security side despite all the um, kind of posters the awareness campaigns there remains a very large section of the population which probably has not imbibed those requirements we've got to continue doing that and i think we've got to supplement it with some of the more, uh, some of the right actions that we've taken things like the customer one off capability that rbi introduced 
a limit on contact lists. <clears throat> These are, in my view, at least required till we get to a stage where I think uniformly across India, everybody understands the availability of the technology, the hygiene that is required from a cybersecurity standpoint. These interventions will help, and they help because they will bring more confidence into the system and therefore give the customer the kind of assurance that he can make that leap from cash into digital. So uh, will it happen? I'm, I'm absolutely convinced it, is hap it will happen. That's why this panel is here, and I think all of us remain passionate about the subject because with that conversations are happening and that information is happening. Uh, the other side of it is, however, you know, when it comes to things like interventions on the economics of this, that I think is something we need to take a little more carefully. Um, you know, the moment we start putting in caps on MDR, etc., it reaches a stage where the provider does not have enough motivation or does not have enough um, you know, in economic willpower and ability to invest in building these channels. So, you know, when it comes to those things, I think, we, you know, uh, yes, some of it is required, but I think there should be a fund, there should be a governmental support for it. So, unless both the consumer side of things and the merchant side of things both evolve at the same level and platform providers are able to provide these capabilities to customers in what is an economical manner, what is a, a value enhancing manner, um, the journey will get stymied. Uh, where we are currently today, I'm fairly convinced, at least personally, and the bank um, I represent um, is convinced that the journey is well advanced. Uh, do we need to do more? Absolutely. I think this journey never ends, but um, you know, we, we continue to invest in all these technologies. We continue to invest in growing this market. Uh, we, we ourselves are seeing a fair amount of movement into digital in our customer base, um, which could be reflective of India. And I think if you talk to the State Bank of India, you'll get even more insights into how they are seeing a lot more movement into this. So I remain confident it will happen, but it will involve investment both on the consumer side and the merchant side of things. Sure. So thanks. Thanks, Shalini. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we have really overshot our time. Uh, with, with such a you know uh, uh, eminent panel and and the passion which all of us have in this subject, I I am sure we can continue going on and on. But uh, you know, given the timelines, uh, I'll have to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, bring the session to an end. I'll again thank all of you uh, for uh, sharing your insights, and I hope the audience uh, got some answers as well as some good uh, thinking points uh, to work on. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Ivan, back to you. Thank you, Kunal, for moderating the panel, and a big thank you to Shalini, Nagaraj, Ravina, Sajid, Shankar, Rama, and Siddharth for your valuable insights. Uh, I'm sure we're taking a lot of takeaways, and uh, the audience has definitely benefited from this session. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.